Praise the Lord. Isn't it good just to be in the house of the Lord and to worship our Heavenly Father, worship Him in truth? Grateful for the many who are over in the fellowship hall, you who are here as we have shared in baptism and now in a little while in the Lord's Supper. Our message this morning is Believer's Baptism and the Sacred Supper, or the, whole, the Lord's Supper. And we'll be looking at both of those and considering what God's Word has to say to us about being baptized, why are we baptized, and then also in the talking about the Lord's Supper. Before we do, for the last several weeks we've been dedicating hymn books that uh, our church has. We have some new hymn books and so many of you have been very gracious and you have um, given funds to have hymn books dedicated in memory of or in honor of loved ones. Uh, we have had a family who has uh, come forward and, and they have then made a donation to cover the remaining balance of the hymn books and so we're just very grateful that God moved among his people, all of us, in a variety of ways to see this happen. There is a verse um, that will go inside the remaining hymnals that reminds us of what the tool is that the hymn book is. And so here's the verse. This will be inside of about 75 of our hymnals. It'll say, sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. And that's what the tool of the hymn book is. It's, a, it's an opportunity to sing the, to the Lord all the earth his praises. It'll also give us the chance as we sing from the hymn book to share the gospel. As we sing about our Heavenly Father and His Son Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So this is a tool to help us to proclaim the good news of His salvation from day to day. And so we are grateful to all of you for your gifts in seeing this take place. And so our as we're thinking of where we are in our church life, we are ex going through experiencing God, many of us are, and we have learned this truth. God speaks by the Holy Spirit to, through prayer, through the Bible, through circumstances and the church or other believers to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. As we were singing that wonderful new hymn of faith, Speak, O Lord, how clear was that hymn in reminding us how dependent we are upon God and His Word, and how necessary it is for us to ask Him to align our hearts with His, so that we might then follow by faith. And so, yes, Lord, speak to us. Speak to us. And so today we are very blessed to be able to celebrate believers' baptism and the sacred supper. And because of that, it is a reminder that these are the two ordinances that were given by Jesus to the church. There were only two. And as Jesus gave us these, these ordinances, these commandments, they were for us then to follow as congregations. Jesus himself said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so we rely on the Lord to do the building, but the foundation of who we are as followers of Jesus Christ fall upon the obedience of following through believers' baptism, and the, on, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we do so in remembrance of Him. Both of those preach the gospel. And so as we go through our message this morning, it's a good reminder that God is speaking to us through the visible symbols of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And so our text in Matthew chapter 28 is where we find the passage for this morning, our first passage. Let me get there. Matthew 28 Verses 19 and 20. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is known as uh, the Great Commission, the Great Sending Forth, the Great Here's Your Marching Orders from the Lord Jesus Christ. Here in these final words of Matthew's gospel, he said to his disciples, therefore go. And what he meant was, as you're going, wherever you're going, as you are going, make disciples of all 
nations, people from every background, every walk, every language, every tongue, every make disciples, then baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey all that I've commanded. Now the good news is Jesus says, I'm going to be with you always. Even to the end of the age, he's going to be with you and I as we go through this life and even till the time that he comes again and this current church age comes to an end at the second coming of Christ. And so praise the Lord, he promises he will be with us. Well, let's ask this question. How important is baptism? You ever thought about that? How important is it? How important? Well, I'd like to answer that question with two other questions. And the first question is this. How did Jesus begin his ministry? And now we know that the Lord Jesus was born of a virgin in the little hamlet of Bethlehem. God the Father is the father of Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Joseph, the stepfather, was there. Together, Mary, Joseph, and the baby was born. Then they moved to Egypt for a couple of years when the Lord commanded them to go there to keep the baby safe. And then up to Nazareth. Jesus grew up in the home of a carpenter. His dad, Joseph, earthly father, was a carpenter. In his teenage years, Jesus astounded the scribes and the teachers of the law at the, at the temple in Jerusalem. He had such a grasp of God's word and into truth and to the depth of, of God's love. And, and they were astonished and amazed at how much he knew and how he was able to teach them with such authority. But it was at his year around 30 that he began his earthly ministry. And for three years, Jesus served the Father in that type of ministry, preaching the good news, healing, and directing people to God. And so how did Jesus begin his ministry? Well, it tells us in the Gospel of Mark, it says, At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptizing by John in the Jordan, was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And so at the beginning of his ministry, at the age of 30, Jesus began by being baptized, setting an example for you and me to follow. Well, Jesus began his ministry by being baptized. How did he end his ministry? He taught us to then follow in baptism. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. These are the last words in the Gospel of Matthew. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you, always, even to the very end of the age. And so how great to know that baptism is important. It's not just something we, we just do and, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I, I, no, it's very important in the eyes of God. Well, let's ask this question. Does the method of baptism really matter? The mode by which we're baptized? Today, there are a variety of ways in which baptism is experienced. In some church traditions, they sprinkle just a little bit. Other church traditions, they pour other church traditions, they immerse, they go all the way underwater. Which is a biblical presentation of baptism? Well, let's just consider. Here's, here's what God's Word says. At the time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan, just as Jesus, what, was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. In John chapter 3, it tells us about John the Baptist. Now John, who's the apostle, one of the 12 apostles of Christ, he writes, now John, John the Baptist, was also baptizing at Aenon, a small little community near Salim, a, a city near on the Jordan River. Now John the Baptist was baptizing at Aenon near Salim because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. If we were to practice sprinkling, we would only need a little bucket of water for all of us here to be sprinkled this morning. If we were practicing pouring, we might need a little bigger bucket. But John the Baptist was baptizing at a place where there was plenty of water. Another scripture passage, this is Matthew's account of the baptism of Jesus. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water 
And at that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And then we read in the book of Acts where Philip has been instructed to go join the Ethiopian eunuch who's riding in a chariot. And the, the eunuch is reading from the, uh, gospel, or the prophet of Isaiah and he's not figuring out what's going on. And so God tells Philip, go up there. And so Philip does. And he sits with the uh, eunuch and the eunuch says, I don't understand what's being said here. And Philip explained to him the good news of Jesus through the prophet Isaiah. Must have taught him that once you become a believer, you follow in baptism. Because as they were riding along in the chariot, it says, and he, the eunuch, he gave orders to stop the chariot. And then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Now, just a little bit ago, we were participating in Linda's baptism. How was she baptized? Did Linda go down into the water? Did she come up out of the water? Amen. And so I'm, I'm just asking, what is the method of believers' baptism? From scripture, it teaches us that it is not sprinkling, it's not pouring, but it is by immersion. And so we have to ask the question, what does the word baptize mean? The word baptize comes from the Greek, and it's from the Greek word baptizo, which means to dip or to immerse or to plunge. It's a market term, like they used in the marketplace of the day, that where um, in the... In the uh, uh, um, a fabric de department of the open air market and they would have this great fabric linen or whatever it was and they'd say you know I'd like that to be a different color they'd take it over to the vats of dye and then they would baptize that that linen that that material into the dye and then it would then from that come out different they would dip it they would plunge it they would immerse it and so this was just an everyday word in those days. And so when the early Greeks and everybody, they were reading the scripture and Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations and baptize them, they understood that meant to say, go therefore and immerse them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Because that was the word for immersion, to be immersed. Well, something interesting happened in history. In 1611, the King James Bible was authorized by King James. And it was translated and brought over into English. It had already been put into English by Tyndall and some others. But yet in 1611, King James officially authorized a new translation of the Bible. And so when the Bible scholars came to this word baptize, instead of translating the word immersion, like I just shared, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, and then immerse them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They just transliterated the word and they, instead of having baptizo, they just would baptize, kind of made it English. And so baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now what happened? Since then, it has now been up to the church to interpret what does that mean. And if you don't look at the original Greek, or if you don't look at some of those other verses we did, it's easy to say, well, we can sprinkle, that'd be fine. Or we can pour, that's okay. Um, and different church traditions do what they do. But what would have happened if those scholars would have put the word immerse in the authorized King James Version? And King James, King, him, Jim, you know, he, he gets the Bible, and he's reading through it. He was baptized in the Anglican Church of England when he was a baby, sprinkled. And so if he goes along and he reads there, go therefore and make disciples of all nations and immerse them in the name, what's going to happen to the Bible translators? It could be off with their heads. I mean, and so they were not loose with scripture. They just simply transliterated the word. And then it was up to the people reading that to say, well, what does this mean then? What does baptism mean? We understand from scripture it means to immerse, to plunge, to dip. Now, historically, there was something else going on. Not quite a hundred years before 1611, on October the 31st, 1517, something took place. That's 503 years from this Saturday. <laughs> ago. <laughs> On October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther, who was the 
Dr. Martin Luther uh, of the Bible chair, the teacher of the Bible at the college university in Wittenberg in Germany. He was a Catholic priest, and he has been studying the Word of God. He had helped translate it into German. He is considering what the Bible says in regard to what the, the church at the time was practicing by their rituals and by their traditions. And as he was reading God's Word, he was, he, these don't match what, what my church is saying I should do and the traditions and rituals we should follow, I don't find anywhere in the Bible. And so this was creating a tension, and there were many different practices that were going on. And so, in fact, he wrote 95 different descriptions of things that the church needed to discuss and deal with. And so in that process, he was just trying to say, let's reform the church. Let's still be the, the one Catholic church, but let's reform ourselves so that we're following God's word, the Bible as our authority, not tradition and ritual that we don't find in Scripture. Well, what do you think happened? It created quite a stir. To the point then that Luther separated from the church. He was a part of history known as those who were the Protestants, the protesters, and they left the church. They separated and the rest is history. But, but even before this, back in the 1500s, something was taking place. There were those who were taking the word of God and translating it into their given language. And in that process, it was allowing people to read God's word. And as they read God's word, they're saying, wait a minute, let's live as the book teaches. Let's don't just follow tradition and ritual that don't have a lot of meaning. Let's read the book and then live as the book teaches. Well, one of those was a fellow by the name of William Tyndale who translated the Bible into English. Don't you know they celebrated and just rejoiced when that took place? Who's they? The church leaders. No, what'd they do? They burned him at the stake as a heretic. He was imprisoned, tortured, and then burned at the stake for translating the Bible into the language of the people. Something had happened in history. The first 300 years, the Bible that they had in those days was written in Greek and in Hebrew. That was the language of the everyday people. And they were able to read the Bible and they could live as the Bible taught. Even to the point that where now Greeks who were being saved and who understood Greek, they could not read the Hebrew Bible, so they translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek. Now they had the whole Bible. That's called the Septuagint. And as they were reading now the whole Bible, they were living as the Bible taught. But a little bit after the year 300, there was a power arising in Rome and a leadership hierarchy that developed and they adopted Latin as the language they used. Why? It was the language of the people. And so the people now are reading the Bible in Latin. But over the course of several centuries, Latin dies out. Italian comes up, French, English, all these languages. But now Italian is an archaic language. Or excuse me, Latin is an archaic language. People can't read the Latin Bible. But there are some who can. Who? The priests, the bishops, and the leaders, the Pope. And so because they can read in the Latin, they then are teaching those who are listening. Those who are listening cannot read the Bible for themselves, so they accept what's being taught. And over the course of 500, a little bit more years, there was some perversion that took place, that there was a higher emphasis of authority put on traditions and ritual, not upon following the word of God. Well, then the Bible started being translated into the everyday language of people. They weren't excited about that because they were now losing their power. They were losing their authority because they were promoting, the, the Bible translators were promoting, our authority is in the word of God. Not in the church, not in the rituals or traditions. It's in Jesus Christ. And so it caused them to experience great persecution. Many of those early translators were martyred, burned at the stake by the church. As people started getting copies of the Bible and they were reading it, they started saying, wait a minute, this doesn't line up, this doesn't line up. And one of those things was baptism. And as they were reading in God's word, they were saying, wait a minute, the way that I was baptized as an infant and I was sprinkled and all of that, that doesn't line up. 
What's the Bible say? And so they started reading the scriptures. And then we went, you and I looked at some of those verses earlier. It, wait a minute. They went down into the water. They came up out of the water. There wasn't this little sprinkling. But who were they baptizing? It wasn't babies and infants. It was those who were old enough to be able to make a choice themselves from their heart and their mind as God impressed on them the need to be saved that they then trusted the Lord. And now as a an adult or a teenager who, who made that choice, they then now said, I accept Christ. But now their baptism was out of order. So they said, I want to be baptized as a believer. That's, that's what it means to obey Christ in this. And so what what they do? They started baptizing themselves and they became known as Anabaptists. The Anabaptists, the word Anna means again. And so they were being baptized again. They'd been sprinkled as babies. Now, as a born-again believer, they were being baptized biblically. But the church wasn't excited about this either. They were changing tradition. They were changing ritual. They said, no, we are being biblical. So how do you think the church responded? The Catholic Church at the same time, and they did with the translators of the word, those who now were the Anabaptists. What we know through history is that they were imprisoned, they were tortured, they were drowned and burned at the stake. It's interesting that in some of those cases where they were drowned, the church said, okay, you want to be baptized again? We'll do it for you. That was their statement. And so what we find is we ask this question, is baptism important? Is there a method to baptism? Yes, according to the word of God, it's by immersion. Now, are we Baptists because, hey, we're Baptists. We do it right. No. We're Baptists because our desire is to read the word of God and live as the Bible teaches. And what happened was, remember back in the Revolutionary War when the British soldiers were here and, and, and they saw those Minutemen? What did they start calling them? Yankee Doodle Dandies, you know? And they were using it as a term of derision. Oh, there's those Yankee Doodle Dandies. And what did they do? They adopted that name. That's right. I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy. Well, back in the day when the Anabaptists and others were baptizing as believers, the church would say, oh, those, those are those baptizers. There goes those baptizers. And they said, yeah, that's who we are. We are those baptizers. We're the Baptists. That's what we do. We, we simply follow God's word. And so the name is stuck. And that's why we call ourselves a Baptist church. Isn't that interesting? Well, if that's the method of baptism, what's the meaning of baptism? What's the meaning? Of course, the meaning is baptism is a symbol of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That we know that the Lord died on the cross to forgive sin. That he was taken down, he was put in a grave, he was buried. And then he rose again on the third day. Victory over death and the grave. Because of that, when you and I are baptized, it's a symbol of us following him in the same way. In the book of Romans, the apostle Paul was led by the Holy Spirit to write this. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And so it's just this, I understand when I'm being baptized, I'm being baptized. It's a say I'm, I'm, I'm giving up the old life. My sin, my old life, my old attitudes, that's gone. And now I'm being raised to walk in new life. Do I still stumble? Do I still fall into difficulty when you push me hard enough? Does something squirt out? Maybe a word or an action that maybe I'm not proud of? Yeah. I'm not perfect after I trust Christ and get baptized and follow him. But, but I'm asking him to help me daily to live in the new life. And so the meaning of baptism is that it's a symbol of all of this before the Lord. It's a momentous event. I mean, think about it for a moment. When, um, well, yesterday, John Christie, you were at a wedding. Your granddaughter was married. Um, there was a point in the service where the minister said something, where they moved from being a bride and a groom to now being married. What did he say? 
just sitting there. The Spirit has joined the two of you together forever. Okay. And did he make a pronouncement? I now pronounce you husband and wife. Up until that pronouncement, in the eyes of God and the laws of the state, they were still engaged. They were a bride and groom. But from the very moment he said, I now pronounce you husband and wife, they became married. Well, the same thing for you and I in baptism. You see, when we identify with Christ, when we're baptized, it's a public way of identifying with Jesus. That up until that moment, yes, we're born again when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. But when we follow him in baptism, in a public way, we are saying, I have joined my life with the Lord. And there are places around the world where when you are baptized, it can cost you a great deal. My first man kiss, if I could call it that, when I was in Belarus was after teaching a pastor's conference, the book of James, and I had this elderly pastor come up over a period of three days. We went through the whole book of James. It was just a, a glorious time. And he come walking right up to me. I don't know what he was saying, but he grabbed me and he just planted a kiss right on my lips. And Russian Baptists kiss each other on the lips. Men kiss men, ladies kiss ladies. And you just have to get used to it. In my years there, if I hadn't been kissed eight or nine times at church, I hadn't been church. I mean, you know... <laughs> But after he was walking away, my translator said, do you know who that was? I said, no, no, I don't. He goes, well, that brother spent 15 years in prison because he baptized two teenagers at midnight in a secret baptism service. Just a few were there because it couldn't be public. But he was caught and he was imprisoned for 15 years for just simply administering the ordinance of believer's baptism. And when I heard that, I wanted to find him and kiss him again. Because when you recognize what others go through and have gone through, just to live by the word of God, how important it is you and I also do the same. And so, yeah, there is a meaning to baptism. Now, I would ask another couple of questions. Do you need to be baptized to be saved? The answer is no. You don't have to be baptized to be saved. Because here's the, here's the equation. What percentage of Jesus Christ's work on the cross was needed for someone to be saved? 95%, 48%, 72%. I mean, what, what was the percentage of what Jesus did on the cross provided for your salvation and for mine when we confess our sins? I see 100% of the work was, was accomplished by Jesus. And so the second question is, what percent of your salvation is up to you? And it's zero. There's nothing we do that can help us earn, achieve, be good enough or whatever to receive salvation. It's all by God. See, the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's a gift. When you get a gift at the holidays or at your birthday, um, you didn't put in, well, here's $10, go get me something better than what you were thinking. I mean, maybe that happens from time to time. But, but in reality, when you get a gift, it's a, it's a total free gift and you receive it or you don't. Same thing with the good news of Jesus. You receive it or you don't. And so with that in mind, who should be baptized? Who should be baptized? Believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. When should they be baptized? Upon their or after their confession of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You see, the order of my baptism was backwards. <laughs> I was, my parents uh, were in the Anglican Church of England, the Episcopal Church here in America. And when I was an infant, they had me sprinkled as a baby, and I'm grateful for my parents doing what they knew to do. They were following what they were taught, and they, they had me uh, baptized uh, as an infant. But then later in life, my mom and dad began reading the Bible, and, and they said, wait a minute, I, this seems different, that a bab person baptized should be older. And so when I was in the sixth grade, mom and dad had me immersed at a Christian church there in Kansas City. It was at the age of 24 when I was saved. 
And so after I was saved, then I was a candidate for baptism, but I didn't realize it. I even now was in college studying for the ministry. I'm now pastoring a little tiny weekend church down in Malta Bend, Missouri. Um, and, uh, and then I realized I had not been biblically baptized as a born again follower of Jesus. And so one Sunday I was baptized, even while as a pastor of a local little small church, because I wanted to, my life to be in obedience to the Lord. And in that process, I mean, what a wonderful, beautiful thing. Well, Jill McCoy's testimony a couple of weeks ago was that, in that she had been baptized, but she knew later in life is when she received Christ and knew she was she knew that she knew she knew that she was born again. And then she was baptized following that. Linda, your testimony. Is that also, there was a point where you were baptized, but you know for certain that you were born again later in life, and so today was saying, I know I want to be baptized, so that I know I'm in obedience to Christ. I wonder, are there others who find themselves in that same position? And if so, then let's talk, let's just get together and talk and, and, and celebrate for you, knowing that you've kind of got it in the right order. There's something special about that. And so believers' baptism is important. It doesn't save us in any way. It's a symbol of our death, burial, and resurrection in trusting the Lord Jesus. Well, let's turn to the sacred supper. Let's talk briefly about this. In just a few moments, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. In fact, at the end of the sermon, we'll have an invitation and if today you would like to say, I want to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior, this would be a chance for you to do that. Or to say, I have received Christ and I want to be baptized. It would be a time for you to come here and, and share with me what you're asking. Or maybe this is the church God wants us to be part of. Or, or here's something I'm praying about. Would you pray with me? Whatever God might put on your heart, we'll have that. And then following the time of invitation, then we will celebrate the Lord's Supper. And so this sacred supper, our text comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In the Pew Bible, it's on page 930. And it says in the scripture, verse 23 through 25, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus said, Do this in remembrance of me. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Does the Lord's Supper carry any meaning? Oh, it sure does. Just like baptism. It's a symbol of what the Lord did on the cross. The Lord's Supper is a visible symbol. When we hold the bread and the cup in our hands, it's a symbol of the body of Christ that was broken for us, a symbol of his blood that was shed, that we then through his shed blood could be saved. You see, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, what we know as the Lord's Supper, on the night of the very first Passover. The people, uh, well, excuse me, Jesus was instituting the Lord's Supper on the night of the celebration of Passover, which had been established back by Moses, by God through Moses, when the nation of Israel was about to be set free from slavery in Egypt. And the people of Israel had been enslaved for 420 some odd years in Egypt. And now through Moses and the ten plagues and all that took place, God used all of that to deliver his people out of Egypt. The last of the plagues was the angel of death. And so the Lord prepared them for what we know as Passover. And he told the people of Israel by Moses that you are to take a lamb and you are to sacrifice the lamb and then take the blood of the lamb and put it over the doorposts. And in such, when the angel of death comes through the land, it will see the blood and pass over that place. And all who are within will be safe. Well, Jesus now in the upper room on the time of Passover takes the bread and the cup and, and he becomes our sacrificial lamb. When he went to the cross, 
He became the lamb without blemish. He became the lamb who never sinned. And as the lamb, he gave his blood that when we apply the blood of Christ to our heart, now death no longer stares us in the face. We live forever with God in eternity. This physical body might end, but we will live forever with the Lord. And so, yes, the Lord's Supper is a visible symbol. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. So Christ died so you and I could have forgiveness of sin. The Lord's Supper is also sacred, very sacred. It's the word what we call holy. It's very holy. And it calls us to remember and reflect on what Jesus did for us on the cross. As a sinner, I cannot achieve eternal life. But Christ paid the price, paid my price. And for all who receive him, he pays their price. He died for their sins. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. What's interesting to know is that the Jewish leaders, when Jesus died on the cross, the Jewish leaders did not take Jesus' life from him. The Roman governor and the soldiers, they did not take his life from him. You see, the truth of Scripture is Jesus gave his life willingly for you and for me. Jesus himself says in John 10, The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. The very last words that Jesus spoke from the cross were these. It is finished. Which meant that he had completed the work God had sent him to do. And now he said, it is finished and gave up his spirit back to be with the Father. Well, as we prepare to think about the Lord's Supper, the sacred supper this morning, let's complete the message by looking at the book of Isaiah chapter 53. I would just like to read Isaiah 53. This is known as the suffering servant written 750 years before the crucifixion. But let's just hear how God gave through the prophet how the crucifixion would take place and what happened because of the crucifixion. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took our affirmities, our sins, and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Who can speak of his descendants? He was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. That's you and me. And will, the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. By my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the sinners, the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That's our Lord. That's Jesus on our behalf. 
Let's pray. Lord, you have taught us from your word this morning and reminded us of these two ordinances of the church given by Jesus. A reminder, a symbol, a reflection of what the cross is all about. Buried, raised again, dying on the cross, providing the way of grace. Lord, for someone this morning who is realizing that they want to trust you with their life for salvation or to confess they're a, a believer and they want to be baptized or Lord, whatever you might be saying, we're going to sing in a moment. And Lord, Father God, we give you this moment and that you be among it, move among us. May your Holy Spirit have his way with us. In Jesus name. Amen. Let's stand and grab a hymn book. We're going to sing hymn number 412. My, the Savior is waiting. And we'll sing two verses, uh, unless there is some movement. But as we sing, let's just let the Lord be in charge of this time. Would you stand with me? And let's sing. Number 412. I have something else. Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Well, you're fine. The Savior's waiting, and so are you. <laughs> <laughs> we are good as that God is too. be seated please we're going to share together in the Lord's Supper if you are born again baptized believer you're invited to share in the Lord's Supper with us and so over in the fellowship hall you'll see over on the the table there uh, to the south side you'll find a table and if you'll go ahead and go over and take a cup and a napkin in case there's a little problem when we're opening up these cups then you'll have that now take a moment and ask for you, if you wish to participate in the Lord's Supper, if you would come forward and receive a cup and a napkin, and then go back to your seats, and we'll continue on. Okay? So, let's do that this morning.